This is Channel 18's coverage of the 2015 Nantucket Book Festival. I'm Charlie Walters, and I'm sitting at the White Elephant Village, which belongs to Nantucket Island Resorts here in the town of Nantucket. Nancy Thayer needs no introduction, especially to a Nantucket audience, but I'm going to give her one anyway. Uh, since 1980, she has written and had published 27 novels. The most recent one is The Guest Cottage that came out in May of 2015. Her work has been published in 15 different languages over those 30 years, 35 years, I should say. And last but not least, for the last 30 years, she's been my wife. Thanks for coming to the interview, Nancy. Well, thank you for inviting me, Charlie. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the guest cottage. It's set on Nantucket. What else do you want to tell us about it? I think it's a good Nantucket story because it involves a summer cottage, and everybody loves summer cottages. And the plot revolves around the fact that a woman who lives in Boston, whose husband has just said he wants a divorce, ha she has a 15-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter, and her mind is just shattered by her husband's announcement. So she takes the money that her aunt left her and decides to rent a cottage on Nantucket so that she can get away and think, think about her life. And she calls an old friend, Susie Swenson, and they do the deal over the phone without a realtor. Then there is another character named Trevor, Trevor Black, who also lives in Boston. He's recently widowed. And he has a four-year-old little boy named Leo, who's, who's kind of strange now with, with the death of his mother. He's sort of even more obsessed with Legos than most four-year-olds are. So Trevor thinks he'll take Leo away from their home. And he calls an old friend, Ivan Swenson, and they agree to rent the cottage. And then Ivan takes off for India. And um, so these two families end up renting the same cottage at the same time for all of July and August. And when they meet each other and they see what's going on and they know they can't get in touch with the people who own the cottage, they decide they have to, to make the best of it. And they do make the best of it. Now, when your first book came out in 1980, you had not been to Nantucket. I think you'd written three books before you visited Nantucket and eventually came to live in 1984. Um, what, what is Nantucket like for you as a writer as a setting for a book as opposed to other settings you've used in your books? Oh, Nantucket is fabulous. It's, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. In the winter, it's a perfect time to write. The storms are so romantic, and all the people who live on Nantucket are really crazy about the storms. It's like, if there's a storm, let's go out and walk on the beach, and the waves are crashing. It provides so many metaphors. And it's also a place where people come in the summer to be happy. They come with hope. They're not checking into the hospital. They're coming to Nantucket. And they're, they're going to take the time to walk on the beach and think about their future and, and hope and, and imagine what could happen. This happens all the time. You know this. We, we live on Orange Street. We hear people walking down the street or biking along. It's a very special place to, to be a place where people come to be happy. Talking about storms, tell the story about the day you were riding at the house and there was a storm. <laughs> all right. Um, this was a long time ago. I had just moved to Nantucket. Charlie and I were just married. Um, and I never lived on Nantucket before. We bought an old house, an 1840s house, on Orange Street. And for some strange reason, I wanted to write about a couple who moved to the island and have a ghost in their house. And 
This is a book called Spirit Lost, by the way. Right, Spirit Lost. And in fact, it did really well in England where they think, oh, you've got a ghost in the house, fine. But in the United States, the editors were kind of like, well, I don't know, that's kind of crazy, a ghost. But when I was writing it, and I was sitting upstairs on my, with my computer, and you were at Music Hall at work, and it was a foggy gray day, and I was right at the part where the wife goes up to the attic where the ghost appears only to her husband. And she's, the wife is so angry at the ghost, but she also doesn't believe in ghosts. And she says, I don't believe in you, you ghost. I don't think that my husband sees you and loves you. I don't even believe you exist. Ghosts don't exist. And at that point, every single bit of electricity in our house went off. My computer died. The, the refrigerator didn't hum anymore. There were no lights on. And that, I get goosebumps even now thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I quickly called you on the phone and said, he was, you were down at uh, West, not Westchester, East, East Chestnut, Chestnut Street. East Chestnut. And I said, are your lights on? And you said, yes. So I called your mother, who lived two blocks away, and said, Martha, are your lights on? And she said, yes. So then I thought, I am going to leave the house and not come back for a while. Now you believe in ghosts. Now I believe in ghosts. But I will tell you that later I found out that just at that moment, a truck hit the utility pole in front of our house, and that knocked out the electricity. So probably it wasn't a ghost. Probably it wasn't a ghost. Uh, talk about your writing habits, your writing schedule, as long as we're talking about ghosts in your computer. Uh, do you have a set schedule every day? You know I do. But our I, viewers don't know that. I get up probably at 6, 7 in the morning, depending on the, on the season, get a cup of coffee, a big cup of coffee, and go up to my study, which is on the top floor of our old house, and which has, thanks to you, a beautiful half moon window. And I can look out the window at the harbor. I can see Grant Point. I can see Great Point Light. I can see the waves if it's, wa if it's windy. I can see the ferries come and go. Um, so I look out the window a little bit, and then I sit down with my coffee, and I work. And I've done that every day for, what, 35 years. Yeah, you were already doing it before we met. Um, and how late in the day do you work ordinarily? It depends. Um, in the past two years, you know I've written two novels. I've written two Christmas novels in addition to my summer novels. And so that has made everything um, have to be done faster. So I'll work in the morning till about 11 or 12. But as you know, I often make little trips downstairs to the refrigerator for a little more coffee or chocolate. And um, in the afternoon, I might go for a walk. I might talk to you. And then later in the afternoon, I'll either work on a new book or I will um, do emails, do business stuff. Now, the whole publicity process in publishing has changed a lot since you began to write 35 years ago. Um, but a lot of people aren't really aware of that. But how, is it, how has it changed your professional career? Publicity is so huge now. And for most writers, it is so not what we do. It, we want solitude. We want to be alone. We want to walk on the beach alone. Um, it's, it's like it's two ends of a spectrum. And publicity is important. And I'm grateful that there are all kinds of publicity, such as television shows. Um, I'm especially grateful for technology, which I love with all my heart. Oh, I love it. I'm on Facebook, and 
I have so many Facebook friends who are, who are really friends, and some of them come to Nantucket and then we meet. A lot of them, I could tell you when their first baby was born or, or how they're doing out after an operation. So that is publicity, but in a way it's not really. It's just like being in another small town. And yet these are people whom you have not met for the most part and likely will never meet. But on some level, there is a friendship there. Absolutely. I often have a fantasy of, of having some huge Prosecco party with, with everyone coming to the island and, and talking. Because, boy, would we have a lot to talk about. Now, if you finish a book on Tuesday, and I tell people this and their jaws drop, if you finish a book on, let's say, a Tuesday, on Wednesday you'll start the next book. And we were just talking the other day at home, and you said you already have the next three or four books laid out in your head. And when those are done, you'll probably have the next three or four laid out. But you've never had writer's block, and you've been doing this virtually all your life. Um, does that surprise you that you never have had it? Because other people, you always hear of writers who haven't been able to write in five years or something. You've never had anything like that at all. It's probably a form of OCD, and secretly I'm insane and you don't know it, because I, I, you know what I'm like. If I'm not writing, I am so grumpy, I'm in such a bad mood, but if I'm writing, if I get my writing done in the morning, then I'm happy. And just now I was thinking, so many people, especially Facebook friends, have written to me to say, please write another Hot Flash Club. So. Today, after I finished working on my novel that's coming out in 2016, I thought maybe I could start working just an hour on a Hot Flash Club book in the afternoons. Just, just interrupt for a minute. You, you published four books that involved the Hot Flash Club, and that's, that's what you're talking about. And a lot of people are saying, where's the fifth? That's right. That's right. It's just waiting in the queue here. Now, going back to your schedule for a moment, when you're writing, you often work six, sometimes seven days a week. It isn't strictly nine to five, Monday through Friday. You might be working on the weekend, um, and you'll write notes in the middle of the night sometimes on a Kleenex box. I, I try to put uh, a notebook and a pen next to our bed, but... Um, I don't know, I think then I write a note on it and then I carry the whole notebook up to my study and then I end up writing on a Kleenex box. There's something about going to sleep. As you know, I have insomnia because I hate it. I hate sleeping, I want to write. I, I want to work on the next book. I want at least to go for a walk in the dark on the beach. I don't want to go to sleep. I find it a tremendous waste of time. Do you ever find a note in the morning and wonder what in the world was I thinking at 2.30 in the morning? Yes, I do, quite often. Or, or I'll find something that is just so wrong that wouldn't really work at all, but I, but I woke up and I thought, I have to write this down. Now, at the top of the show, I mentioned you'd written 27 books, and I think about half of them at the moment are available in paperback, but all of them are available as e-books. That's right. Um, in other words, e-books... The technology behind ebooks has allowed you to have in print books that might not otherwise be in print. That's right. That's another reason I love technology. Yes, they're, all of my earlier books are available in, in print as ebooks. And a lot of people who are reading your books now are going back right. and finding books that they probably didn't know existed. And how would you compare your early books with your, your current books or your middle period or whatever? Because your style has changed over, the, over 30 years, 35 it's years. It's changed tremendously. And I, again, this is due to technology, which I love. I love technology. Um, but when I started writing, when I wrote my first novel, Stepping, I wrote it on an electric typewriter. I didn't even have a computer. And I don't think we had 
I don't even think VCRs were out then. I sound like I'm talking about 1817 or something, but we didn't have all these cool things that we have. And so books were much longer in general. They were more um, talkative, more friendly, and um, more expansive. But as time has moved along and now we have so many toys to play with. We have iPhones and we have uh, DVDs and we have DV DVRs and we have um, all the games like Wii and so on. And people seem to be more in a hurry. And so my books are much faster paced than they used to be. We have shorter attention spans it seems as well, whether it's reading a book or listening to music or you know, whatever it happens to be. Would, would you agree with that? Do you think that? that's true with music? Uh, I would say so, yeah. yeah. I, I think in, in the same way that fewer people want to sit down and read Middlemarch for 600 pages, yeah. fewer want to sit down and listen to a 40-minute a symphony. I think you're right about that. And I know I'm, I'm part of the readers who love the fast-paced plots because in the winter, I allow myself a great big fat 600 page book and I'll curl up with that because it is winter and there's, there, I, this winter we couldn't even leave the house. So I read a lot of, like I read The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann a lot in the winter because that's a book that you really need to take your time with. But in the summer, it would be almost maddening to try to read it. Too heavy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, as we do this interview, um, this is not the first time I've interviewed you. Do you want to talk about the first time? Sure, I'd love to. Which was in 1982. Do you want me we, to talk about it? We were both it? eight years old. <laughs> I came to visit a friend, Dinah, who, by the way, was interested in you and part of the reason I came was because you were this handsome young man with a music store who loved music. And Dinah said, come to Nantucket. And I said, I can't, I'm divorced. It would cost too much money. I don't know, even know where it is. And Dinah said, well, I tell you what, I'll get Charlie to interview you on his television show, Arts View. So I came over. And you interviewed me, and you drove me to the airport the next day, and it's been very nice ever since. We got married two years after that, almost to the day. Uh, let me add that when your friend was trying to get you to come down here, she told you that if you flew down here for the interview, it could be a tax deduction. That's right. So you heard it here, my first, <laughs> I was first a tax deduction for my wife-to-be. And a very good one. <laughs> what are you working on now? Oh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm right in the middle of a book for 2016. I'm working on a novel about a really wealthy, expansive, charmed family who live in Boston and have a big summer house on Nantucket. And the, the family consists of the parents and four children. And each of the children brings home a friend during uh, summer break from college. And these children love Nantucket so much. And the mother, Susanna Champion, is so, so happy to have everybody around. And she loves to cook. And she calls these people her summer children. And um, when you've got eight people in their 20s, uh, a lot of plot devices can, can come rolling along. Nancy Thayer, thank you for joining uh -huh. me on and off the air. Oh. Uh -huh. I'm Charlie Walters for Channel 18, covering the 2015 Nantucket Book Festival. We've been at the White Elephant Village of Nantucket Island Resorts. Thank you for tuning in.